We're back in Romans. We're going to be in chapter 2 looking at verses 1 through 16. If you need a Bible to follow along, you can raise your hand and we'll bring you one marked to Romans chapter 2. As the Apostle Paul writes to the church from Rome, from the city of Corinth, in about 57 AD, we get a stark description of the condition of mankind from God's perspective. We've heard a lot of what, about what man has to say about God, but in chapter 1, we got to hear what God says about man. We see the condition of people that deny the reality of God in the darkness God turns them over to because that's what they want. They want a world and a life without God and that's what he's going to let them have. As we understand the fallen condition of mankind, chapters 1 through 3 in the book of Romans will show us why mankind needs a savior. Why we need to be saved from the effects of our sinful condition because the Creator, Almighty God, is righteous and just and must judge deliberate, willful sin against God. Yes, the God that everyone instinctively knows exists, yet deny to themselves in the great lie of humanity. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? <laughs> Man, Romans 1 and 2 are some of the darkest chapters in all of the whole Bible. We see how difficult this thing of salvation really is for God. Thus, the book of Romans. It's a book from God that speaks to the deepest needs in a human's heart. A book that speaks to the secret, hidden things of a human being's heart. And as Paul, by the Holy Spirit, addresses the unrighteous that reject the reality of God to themselves in chapter 1, in chapter 2, now he's going to address, in a sense, the self-righteous, or those who judge others for the same sinful condition they themselves are in without Christ. So a warning. We may hear things that make us evaluate our own judgmentalism even though we are in Christ. And at times I feel that the Lord raises a soul mirror through the teaching of his word that helps us to see what we're really about. Don't run from that. Embrace it and agree with what God says about you. Because he loves you, he cares about you. We might even find that, that we're blind to certain attitudes or actions in our lives that hinder us from growing in Christ's likeness ourselves. The Bible has a funny way of doing that, you know. Exposing where we really are in God's evaluation of us. And I learned something last week at the park during the resurrection celebration from Pastor Isaac. And that I don't want to be a little baby. <clears throat> and if you, you missed the event, uh, they had him dressed up as a baby there. And, and Yoli said, so do you want to be a little baby? And he said, no, I don't want to be a little baby. I said, well, you need to grow in Christ. So that's what I learned from Pastor Isaac. <laughs> so let's look at Romans chapter 2 this morning. Starting in verse 1, Paul tells us, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you judge for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And just a note, 
he's speaking about verses 29 through 30 in chapter 1. He's writing to a world without God, in a sense, but he's writing to the church, and we'll find out why in a minute. He says in verse 3, Do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Oh, yeah, I can already tell this is going to be an uncomfortable text. It has been for me. As I began to work through this, this passage, I saw judgmentalism towards others in myself, even though I know this is written to the ungodly world, those without Christ. And I really don't want to be that way, but alas, it is a part of that old nature in us that we need to be aware of in Christ in order to overcome it, even though at this point, as I said, Paul is not really writing about those who are in Christ, but making a point, a foundation, where believers might come from as a reference. And for us not to return to that place after receiving salvation in Christ. It's almost like Paul is making a distinction between those who are totally rejecting the morality of God in them in Romans chapter 1 to now Romans chapter 2 to those who acknowledge the morality of God and yet judge those with a lesser morality than they have because they do judge immorality and ungodliness recognizing that is of God and yet also practice immorality or ungodliness that they don't judge. But God does. We're told that God judges in truth, not in rel relevance or a conditionalism. Years ago, I was a pastor of Calvary Chapel in northern Arizona and uh, I was in a associate pastor there and we used to take a group of kids to the movie theater that were, you know, didn't come from families that could uh, afford movies and things like that. We'd take like 10 kids t and we'd go to the Target store and load up candy and stuff in our coats and purses and everything. And this little boy is about eight years old and he's looking at this sign and it says, no food or drinks. <laughs> and he starts pulling on my jacket. <laughs> pastor Joe, Pastor Joe, the sign says, I'm like, be quiet, be quiet, man. And the, and the lady's there, you know, looking at me, and I'm like, okay, everybody back to the car. <laughs> everybody goes back out there, throw all the candy in the Suburban, go back up there, and I tell my wife, you better get out the big credit card. Because <clears throat> you can't take those kids to movie without popcorn, candy, seven bucks for a box of popcorn, that's unjust. It's unrighteous. <laughs> then you don't buy their popcorn, right? But boy, how our sin looks so bad on others, doesn't it? You know, always wanting to cut the corners. I think I may have some Jewish roots in me. Because <laughs> I can help you find a way to circumvent what this says. So we have to be careful, don't we? The term Paul uses... Oh man, do you see it there in verse 1? It's from the Greek and it's a euphemism for all man or all humanity, thus verifying the descriptive state of mankind without Jesus. This helps us to, to think about the context here, which is so important in these passages. Um, even those who think they are more moral or godly than others, as verse 4 implies to us, deep inside, every person knows God's goodness and forbearance and even long-suffering patience that God has not judged them. 
which should lead a person to repentance or changing their mind about what they think about God or a condition at least where they want to change their mind about their immoral behavior because they can sense God has not judged them but was patient. Oh, how many times in our lives, especially before Christ, did we pray, oh God, if you'll just get me out of this, I promise I'll change my life. I know it happened to me, which proves to me what Paul is saying here is true. It's realistic, though, and through my own experience, I actually experienced the grace and the forbearance of God, knowing I did deserve judgment, and I prayed that prayer. I know you probably never did that, but I did. And for many of us who came from, let's say, a very dark social past, once we found the forgiveness of God through Jesus, man, did we ever fall in love with Him. And it wasn't because we were more spiritual or greater people. No, Jesus said, He who is forgiven much loves much. So if you think I really love Jesus, that tells you something about me. As Jesus was speaking to the religious Jews of His time, that would fit into this category Paul is talking about as he continues in verse 5 and says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath. Remember chapter 1 we learned this wrath is not God being angry. That wrath equals God's judgment and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. Verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil or practices ungodliness of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's very important to remember the context here is being justified in the righteous judgment of God. Being justified in the righteous judgment of man. Paul is laying a foundation to say God is the creator and he's a righteous judge and he has to judge unrighteousness because he's a righteous judge. Paul says the ungodly store up for themselves the judgment of God. Speaking of the day of judgment, Revelation chapter 20 in the Bible, where you won't be if you're a believer in Jesus because your sin was judged at the cross through Jesus Christ. So he's writing to this big, broad world out there in Payson, Arizona, the Rim Country. It's our Rome. There are seven hills here, you know. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20 is the great white throne judgment of God to all who reject God's plan of salvation for mankind. We're going to see in chapter 3 where God says all have violated his law and are under judgment of God. So he offers to make that payment through his son. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Paul points to the hardness of the human heart, impenitent or, or without remorse for the obvious ungodliness of their lives. As God, it says, renders to each person according to their deeds. Speaking to that self-determinant nature or free will of man. Remembering Paul pointed out that each human has the definite witness of the reality of God in them from chapter 1. So a person would acknowledge that reality 
he says in verse 7, clearly demonstrated by their actions, and uh, if they acknowledge the reality of God by doing righteousness and all of these things, that they're going to be with God. But we know the Bible says none of us are righteous. No, not one. Remember that when you feel self-righteous, <clears throat> that there are none righteous <clears throat> compared or, or according to what God sees as the judge of righteousness. I mean, we might have a good day once in a while, right? Where we help the, the little lady across the street and we give a lot of little money to charity. But yeah, we once in a while have a good day, but we are unrighteous in the judgment of God because we have all sinned against God. And this is the point he's making. Those who reject the reality of God in them obeying what they know is ungodly and unrighteous. Well, we've all done that, haven't we? The judgment of God awaits them for all mankind. Even the Jews, he says here, as Paul declares, these two people groups, Jews and Gentiles, because these are really the only two people groups in God's eyes. But all are under the same law of the judgment of God. But let's be clear, Paul is not saying if we do good, we go to heaven. And if we do bad, we will be judged. Paul is simply laying out the condition, the foundation for this judgment, showing people the need for Christ. Oftentimes we can ask, well, why is he taking so much time to explain this to the church, to Christians in the church? Well, because they lived in Rome. And they, the church was going to go out and people would say, well, do you follow Zeus? And they'd say, no, I follow Jesus. Why? He wanted them to be able to explain this to people in their world. Like we're going to go out into the rim country and find a lot of people that worship all kinds of things. And some of them are self-righteous people who think they believe in God. One guy even told me one time, I follow the 12 commandments. And I was like, that's a new one. <laughs> I, I haven't heard that one yet. So what, what are those? And he starts going through them. He gets about three and he's like, can I have another piece of pizza? <laughs> I was like, okay. <clears throat> Ever try following the 10 commandments? The one that got me was the first one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And when that soul mirror came up in my life, I went, well, I love God, but I, I don't think I love him with all my heart. Can I have another piece of pizza? <laughs> I think you get the point. There are those that reject the reality of God, and there are those in this world that think they're righteous, but they're righteous in their own eyes. In God's eyes, he says, there are none righteous. So Paul continues in verse 11, telling us, for there is no partiality with God in the context of judgment. If you're a Bible student, I recommend you write in margins or notes. The context is God's righteous judgment for man. So there's no partiality with God in the context of this righteous judgment for man. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law, speaking of the law of God, are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles or non-Jews who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, the law of God, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. I'm really good at excusing them. And it's in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ 
Paul says, according to my gospel or my statement or the good news of Jesus. It's interesting. Paul writing to the church at Rome uses the term law in the context of the law of God for judgment. Citing there is no partiality with God in the context of the judgment of God under the requirement of the righteous law of God that requires judgment if God indeed is righteous. Which Paul is establishing as the foundation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's for man's need. For the gospel or good news of Jesus in each person's life is there for that person who acknowledges they have violated that law of God. And they acknowledge that before God in truth. So it's more than just saying a prayer that I want Jesus in my life. It's acknowledging the truth of why you need Jesus in your life. I'm sure many of you have had <clears throat> children and we're disciplining then we ask them, do you know why do you have to move the wood pile from that side of the yard to that side of the yard? <clears throat> it's not just to move wood, it's to have discipline in your life and do you know why? It's important that they understand this and God is the same way with us, with all people. So, whether a person acknowledges the law of God or not, that law is in them and that's being clearly established in this place. They have to be truthful with themselves about what's righteous. There are many people in our world today and evidently back then as well <clears throat> that lie to themselves about their position in God's law or personal righteousness. Even thinking they may not be perfect, but at least they aren't as bad as some. So in a sense, they judge themselves, which Paul pointed out earlier, but not in truth. Which Paul verified that God would judge mankind in truth. Do you want some popcorn? It's only $7 a box. No! So we have a way of rationalizing our own truth, don't we? I do. And I'm trying to get over it. And I'm much better than I used to be. At least I think I am. I better ask God about that. God's truth is absolute truth for both God and man. And it's witnessed by all creation. So if man could live a completely righteous life before God, they would not be judged by God. But is it fair that God would judge us so rigidly, so sternly? Well, it is according to what Paul declares by the Spirit of God here in this passage and what Paul declared from chapter 1 as well. That man is without excuse because man knows God is real. And then number two, that man willfully sins against that knowledge of the real God and the righteousness of God. That's why none of us are righteous in and of ourselves. <clears throat> Therefore, if God is completely righteous and just, then God must judge those who knowingly sin against God. <clears throat> I'm going to pause here for just a moment. As you go out into the city of Rome this week, oh, I mean Payson, and you encounter people, you're probably going to encounter those who believe that they're righteous before God. We have to ask them questions <clears throat> very, with a lot of sensitivity, very loving, very gentle. Ask them if they'd ever stolen anything. Ever. Ask them if they'd ever lied or cheated. 
Ask them if they'd ever blasphemed the name of God. All of those things would be a witness to that person that they were wrong. And based on Romans chapter 2 verses 1 through 16, we can tell them, you put your hand up to God and you told him, I'm the judge and I'll do what I want and that's why God will judge you. Unless you confess that to God, that you've been unrighteous and you want God's plan for salvation. You can do that, you know. They don't throw people in jail for that in America yet. At least, I don't think they do. Maybe they do. I don't know. I'm not sure. If it causes a riot, then like Paul, you'll go to jail. But I'll come and visit you. <laughs> like one pastor told me when I thought I was going to go to prison for a long time, we'll bring you Bible studies every week. And I was like, he goes, you'll learn the Bible. You can get your degree. It's going to be okay. I was like, it's seven years. <laughs> I'll be an old man when I get out. He goes, you'll only be 37. I'm like, that's what I mean, I'll be an old man. <laughs> so is it fair that God would judge so rigidly only if he's a righteous, just God, right? How would we feel about a judge who let a mass murder and a rapist just off the hook because he was having a good day? We would say that's unjust. So would we expect less from God? Oh no, we haven't committed murder or rape or any of those things. But we lied, we stole, we blasphemed God, and we knew it was wrong. So we did that against God. So he has to judge without, it says, without partiality, right? There's no levels of, God says, well, we'll let you go for the popcorn thing. I, I had 10 kids, I understand. No, he has to judge without partiality. We see here, even those who never heard of God know that God exists. Verses 14 and 15, as mankind has this instinctive knowledge of God and God's law in them, in their conscience. This is called the human consciousness. We have a consciousness of God from birth. It was placed there by God and proven by the fact that every human knows right from wrong. Even in cultures that have never heard about the God of the Jews, that's why Paul makes this distinction. Whether Jews or Gentiles, they have the law of God. Even the far off tribes in New Guinea that have primitive Stone Age tribes, they knew that God existed and was righteous. All of the books we read about the early missionaries, once they explain God to these people, they say, we know of that God, but we didn't know who he was. We're glad you came. Would you like some soup with a head in it? <laughs> yeah, they were headhunters and cannibals. They knew it was wrong, but it was a part of their culture and their way of life. And they didn't even know why they did it. They just said, this is what we were taught. But we always knew it was pretty yucky. And I'm sure the missionaries were like, you think? <laughs> Have a bologna sandwich. I mean, <clears throat> So even those who never heard of God knows God exists because of their conscience that God placed there. Proven by the fact, we all know right and wrong. Murder, stealing, lying, unfaithfulness, harming anything in an unright, unrighteous way testifies to the human conscience of it being wrong. Well, why do people do it then? It's because they're sinners. They're rebellious. And the more they sin in that way, there's a demonic influence that comes over their lives and it takes them over. That's why you often find, you know, children that have been involved with killing animals when they're young develop tremendous psychiatric issues and, and many of them become murderers when they're older. Even the secret things, it says in verse 16, that no one else sees, revealing to us that God sees our inner conscience. That can make you feel very good 
or very bad, depending on where you are in your relationship with God through Christ. Many times it brings a comfort to me to know that my Father in heaven judges the things of my heart, my inner conscience, and reveals them to me, not to criticize me, but because he loves me. And he wants me to grow. He doesn't want me to stay like Pastor Isaac and be a little baby. <clears throat> he wants me to grow in Christ's likeness. So he raises that soul mirror as I study his word and I understand what love means. And I look at Jesus and it begins to change me from the inside out. I realized why the devil hates this ministry so much and you turn for Christ is because we're about changed lives and you're not going to feel comfortable here if you just want to go to church and stay the same. You're going to feel very uncomfortable here and I hope you are uncomfortable if you don't want to change, if you don't want to let Jesus work in your life, if you want orthodox Christianity, you're in the wrong place. Because you'll feel that, that condemnation as we share the word. But be careful it's not the conviction of the spirit that says, I love you. I have something so much better for you. I don't want you to be Sunday Christians. I want you to be spirit-filled Christians with the, the Holy Spirit over your life and a changed life that glorifies God, right? That's a painful experience. Believe me, I know. <laughs> I want to be a little baby. And I want my baba and I want things my own way. And Jesus says, no, there's so much more for you. You guys know what I'm talking about? Or is it just me? I think you know what I'm talking about. Don't pretend. I know you're there with me. The secret things of the heart. The consciousness of of man. The inner conscience is oftentimes what the Bible calls our heart. Be careful. God said through the prophet Jeremiah that our heart is the most deceptive thing in us. That only God can really know it. So I come to him and say, God, reveal my heart to me. Thank you for being so patience. It's your goodness that leads me to repentance. I know I'm not going to be judged because I'm in Christ but I want to avoid that godly discipline because the last round, I think, left a mark. <laughs> I hear a little bit of feedback. If you'll mute those mics for me up on the stage, I appreciate it. It's coming through the subwoofer, so. But anyway, it's probably that fan, or we had to turn the fan on because this unit crashed on us this morning. The computer crashed, the unit crashed, and now I'm crashing. So to summarize, all human beings will be judged by God because God is just and righteous and must judge unrighteousness to be just. Does it make sense? Wherein lies the beauty of the gospel of Jesus? That unrighteous man can be justified to God by putting their trust in in the work of the cross, but they must be honest with themselves and God and admit, I need a savior. I have been unrighteous. Think about that, because God does not want you to have a Christian religiosity. He wants you to have a firm foundation. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing through this text. It seems Human beings, myself included, struggle with being real with God or even themselves at times. We know the answer is because of that fallen nature of man in us we inherited through the first man, Adam, who denied the reality or the authority of God. And he chose his own way. And then mankind subsequently was born into that condition. Something else we know about God is that God is love. We're told that from the Bible. Love, the love of God philosophically, demands a choice for any self-determinate situation. Human beings, angels, those with 
what we call free will. This also includes God. He had to make a choice to love us and the Bible says he did it before the foundation of the world, knowing each one of us. He could see that we would want the truth in our lives and he revealed Christ to us. We know there's no other way, O oh man, O oh humanity, to be saved. Not through good religious works, not through anything that we do. The Bible tells us that over and over and that's why Jesus had to go to the cross. Because you're going to go into Rome today and people are going to tell you, well I just do the best I can and I try to follow the 14 commandments. <laughs> and you need to be equipped to share these things with them in a loving, gentle way. It seems simple enough, but it requires the truth in mankind. As we look at this text this morning, we can find a lot of practical application for our lives, even instruction for us today from God's Word, as it seems one of the main issues for man is that of judging one another it says here from chapter 2, while they are just as guilty in some sense, in some way of that issue. And no, I may not rob a bank, but I'm going to rip off the movie theater because I think they charge too much for popcorn and I'm doing a good thing. I'm taking 10 kids. So we rationalize our unrighteousness when we set ourselves up as the judge. It's important for us to grasp the essence of this because we make terrible judges. We are called to evaluate things in our own lives and in the lives of others for the purpose of God's purpose in people's lives and in our own lives. Just as Jesus taught us not to judge one another in the context of condemning one another, but to evaluate first our lives. You remember that one, take the plank out of your own eye. I'm thinking, I can't picture this. <laughs> but it's, of course, you know, an illustration of that's, that's how ridiculous it is when we judge others because we're not equipped to do it, because we're just as guilty according to, to the Word of God here. We have to, and we need to evaluate our lives and the lives of others for the purpose of helping them. And, and the purpose of saying, man, I've been in that place. Follow me. I found a new path. <laughs> and it's working out really good. Follow me as I follow Christ, right? We have the tendency, I think, to be easy on ourselves for our ungodly actions, at least I am. But I, I think we have a tendency to be harder on others that are ungodly. As the old saying goes, our sin really looks worse on others than it does on us. Have you ever noticed that? Ooh, I hate that. I'm like, man, I can't believe you. you're doing that. You know, guy pulls up a stoplight, you know, pulls out no turn signal on. I'm like, man, all you got to do is turn on the turn signal. And I'm sitting there without my turn signal on. And then I'm like, oh. it's a good thing I didn't pull out the gun. <laughs> right? Well, our sin really looks worse on others than it does on us. A classic example. Um, how did I get to that slide? I don't know. Let's go to this. There we go. I told you I was about to crash. The classic example from the Old Testament, of course, is the life of King David. You remember him from 1 Samuel, the book of Psalms. Man, we learned so much about David. Um, he was a man that followed God. He really loved the Lord. He believed in God and he served God. But he had many faults as well. Just like we do. And after David had taken another man's wife because he was king and he could do whatever he wanted. It's a good thing they didn't make me king. I heard somebody complaining about one of the pastoral pre presidents whose name was Obama or something. And I was saying, I would have done worse. And he looked at me like, said, I, if they would have made me king, I would have blown it a lot worse than that. And maybe you would have too. 
But he really blew it because he was a king. He took another man's wife because he was the king. He thought he could do whatever he wanted. And then he arranged to have her husband killed to cover up an unwanted pregnancy. He had thought and he had gotten away with all of this. About a year later, a prophet of God came to David and told him about the story of a rich man who had many sheep, everything he wanted in life. Then he took this one poor man's little sheep. It was the only sheep he had. And it was like a, his pet. And he took that sheep and he slaughtered it to eat a dinner with a guest that he had. And David, of course, was furious. He was enraged. He said, that man should be put to death. And then the prophet said these terrible words. David, you are that man. Oh, our sin looks so bad on others. David's sin was exposed and fortunately for David he repented. He changed his mind. He was broken before God. You can read about it in Psalm 51. But he paid a heavy price. God disciplined him for the rest of his life as a reminder. I don't let kings do whatever they want. Remember, you're the king over your own life, right? You have a kingdom. It's called your life. But it is, is it under the righteousness of God? Especially here in America. I've seen over the years one of the tactics of our spiritual enemy is to move us or in a way influence us to focus on the failures and the faults of others in a judgmental condemning way which sets us up as a judge an unrighteous judge and that cuts us off from the active grace of God upon our lives and we can become bitter and blind lacking the expression of grace to others as a result, even as believers in Jesus. I've seen the enemy do this in my own life. I've watched him do it to so many people. That's why I warn them not to watch Fox News. <laughs> Hannity is enraged with so many people because they did this wrong and they did that wrong. And I can tell you there's no grace of God in that man's life, even though he says he believes in God. I want to write him a letter. But the Lord says, you think it would do any good? <laughs> no. <laughs> but be careful when you're watching people that all they do is point out the faults of others and yet have no viable solution. If they did, they would run for office. You know, I might vote for Hannity if he stopped being so caustic and hateful towards people. But anyway, be careful of the religious right. Is it judgmental? Is it filled with God's grace and God's love? Think about Jesus. They spit in his face, beat him to a pulp, nailed him to a cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sean Hannity needs to learn about Jesus. And I'm not picking on poor Sean, you know. But I just, the guy gets to me sometimes, you know. And he, fortunately, he gets to the liberals as well. But, you know, <laughs> think about what you're doing, what you're filling yourself with. Is it the expression of grace? The Word of God tells us that God gives grace to the humble, but He resists the proud. And that's why our spiritual enemy uses that tactic against us. Once we set ourselves up as that kind of judge, we cut ourselves off from the grace of God that we need so desperately. You know why? Because we're sinful. We're not righteous. The Bible says so. So we need to get off the high horse, right? And get on the cross with Jesus. And have that same attitude in our life. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, told us to do all things without complaining and disputing. Boo! That's a kick in the gut. And he said, so you can become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation news flash. 
We live in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation and we stand there saying, this ain't right, this ain't right. Wake up, grow up. Don't be like Pastor Isaac. <laughs> Don't be a little baby. Be walking in the truth and the love of God, right? And of course, you know I'm making fun of Pastor Isaac because of the picture I showed you, right? You know that. He's probably going to come in here and beat me up. <laughs> the Apostle Peter said, be partakers of the divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world through the lust of man. James says, you have not because you ask not. You argue and you fight and there's wars because you don't get what you think you want. It's time for us to grow up. It's time for us to be transformed into where God wants us to be. I admit it, I gripe and complain about things all the time. It's certainly not a part of the divine nature. And it's a, a part of that fallen nature. So I have to be aware of it and know it's going to be a, a part of my life. And I think maybe you need to join me in that. And when we're griping and complaining about other people, especially other believers, are we not setting ourselves up as judges over them? Cutting ourselves off from the grace of God that we need so desperately because we're just as guilty? The only difference is we have Christ? Oh, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, isn't it? We are promised that God began a work in us and He's faithful to complete that work until the day of Christ Jesus. So let us not even condemn ourselves, but to confess to God, agree to God, that we're not what we want to be in Christ, but hopefully we're not what we used to be, right? We're not reaching under the front seat for a 45 anymore, are we? No, we're not doing that. And when we catch ourselves reaching for that gun, being critical and judgmental, which we all do, let us confess it to Jesus. It's not of Him. Let Him change our minds through His goodness that He might grant us repentance through His grace day by day. And the world is going to see it. Even if they don't acknowledge it, it'll be a witness to them the reality of God in us. Amen? I want to ask the music ministers to come. Would you stand with me this morning? Well, I think we all need to come to Jesus every day, don't we? If you've never been truthful with God about your unrighteousness, confess to Jesus right now. I'm unrighteous before God. And I want the cross of Christ in my life to have eternal life so I won't be judged by God in wrath. We can pray with you after the service. If you've, if you've been a religious Christian, maybe said a prayer, Oh God, oh Jesus, come into my life. But you've never confessed that you were going to be judged. And that Jesus paid the price for that judgment in your life. <clears throat> so that you are not going to be judged by God in wrath. Yes, we may be disciplined by God and it's a good thing. Children need discipline. Or we'll be little babies. We want to grow in Christ. Amen. We're going to be here to pray with you. I know that life can really do some damage to us. We can have some deep hurts that we feel like we can't overcome. But I promise you the grace of God is more powerful than any hurt you've ever experienced. And it's the healing ointment that we all need in life. I promise you that, that God will heal that hurt place and He will use it for His glory in your life. Amen? Let's think about these things. If you want to receive Christ, you can come forward. If you want to pray right now to receive Christ, you can do that. If you've been judgmental, confess it to God. If you've been down on people like Sean and the rest of them, just tell them, man, that's not of Jesus. He, he wouldn't do that. Bring your hearts to Him this morning. Bless Him. The reckless love. Thank you, Lord. 
You've been good to us, Lord. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a man, you breathed your life in me. Yes, you have, Lord. so thankful for that reckless love that reached our lives. Send us out now through your grace, Lord. Let your grace overflow us and when we feel that we're being judgmental, we can just bring it to you. When we're demanding that this ain't right, we will say, well, Jesus made it right because none of us get this right. But he got it right at the cross. Amen. Give him praise and glory this morning for the goodness of God. Praise you, Lord, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.